as I started speaking out against injustices, race and police brutality, a lot of the churches turned their backs on me. And at the time I didn't get it. I struggled heavily feeling as if this must be how God is. And why, why would I want to be with a God like this? Welcome to the This Is Me TV podcast brought to you by Impactus. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. We've got a great show for you today. We're talking with Lecrae about his new book, I Am Restored. Welcome, Lecrae, to the podcast. This book, Mm -hmm. you went deeper than I think anyone was expecting. Yeah, some people, you know, say it's too deep. You didn't have to tell all that, but... uh... You know what's so refreshing about that? The church doesn't do this. The -hmm. church doesn't talk about this kind of pain. And you did. Yeah, well, thought it was necessary to just, you know, it was, it was healthy for me and healing for me. And so I wanted that for other people. Someone asked me the other day, like, what's Cray's book all about? Basically, it's, it's vulnerable, to say the least. It's, it's extremely transparent. You cover depression, anxiety, church hurt, childhood trauma, sexual abuse, self-medication, racism, doubting God, a failing marriage, political homelessness, and so much more. Why did you write this book? For me, um, it's twofold. You know, one, I wrote it for people out there who were hurting and needed a voice. Um, And I wrote it for people out there who were trying to understand my perspectives and just weren't getting a comprehensive view. And so now it's here. So whenever you're trying to understand, you can just like, I can say, here, read the book if you want to understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to have a conversation anymore. We just hand them the book. <laughs> no, <there you> go. <laughs> there it is. Was there a part that was the hardest to, r- to write? For me, it was, it was stuff about um, my family and marriage, just because that's more private and personal. Um, and of course, my wife had to be okay with me talking about some of those things. And then um, anything that's divisive, because I, I just know, you know, whenever you start talking about terms that create division, um, it, it really, they're not divisive, but things that, that people divide around, topics that people divide around, you know, all that's always hard to write because you just are wanting to make sure, did I get this right? Did I say this, this? Did I communicate this? Because there's so many people people's perspectives that's, uh, that are peering into this. You just lay it out basically from the beginning that you had, you woke up in a fog, you woke up depressed, you woke up in a clinical depression. Can you remember that? Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. I mean, something you don't forget, um, you know, it was just waking up and um, the best way I can describe it is like having a black and white filter over a photograph and you can't remove the filter. You're trying to see the colors, you're trying to see the dynamics, but you just can't. And so you're waking up every day, hoping that that filter would go away and you just can't make it go away. Um, So it's, you know, it, it inhibits your ability to just smile, to appreciate things, to be happy. Um, It's just hard. Yeah. And with that, you, you talked about like, even just like, everything was meaningless. Like it was, you, you didn't want to leave the house. You, you just started dragging down people around you. Like, it's just like, you just weren't yourself. It completely was a different person. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to eat. Didn't want to talk. Didn't want to move. Didn't want to go do the littlest things, shopping, anything. I was just, um, it was a dark, dark time. Very, very dark. And, and it's not just based off of one thing. So we can't say like, what was the thing that got you there? It's, it was a buildup of time of, of many things over time. Yeah. And so can we, can we go back and touch on a few of these places? So it starts in childhood, mm-hmm. right? You, you grew up without a father. Um, you were told constantly that you weren't enough of a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were beat, you were molested on top of many other things. How did you feel growing up as a kid? What was that like for you? Or is this just, hey, this is what kid life is like? It was, that's exactly kind of how I felt. Um, I I did feel a little bit like it was me against the world. So, you know, I was just kind of like, man, you know, I gotta go for it. I gotta go 
enjoy life and have fun because I don't know when this will end. Um, there's nothing on the other side waiting for me. So I just got to go and, and get it. Uh, you know, the, the, the secure environment was not something that I grew up in. So for me, um, you're just a lot more reckless because there's chaos going on around you. And what was your desire as a kid? Did you have a burning desire or was it like, did you like, Oh, when I grow up, I'm going to do things different or when I grow up or it's just like, no, that's it. No, I really, unfortunately I was what you would call a hedonist. I just wanted fun because I didn't know what tomorrow would bring. So I didn't look past 18 years old. I didn't know if I would be 18. So, you know, I, I didn't really dream past 18 years old. Uh, I just thought, you know, I'll turn 18, maybe. Um, I just want to have fun, whatever fun looks like. Um, and if that meant breaking the law, cool. Growing up with stuff, you found hip hop, you found acceptance in that. You became, you know, you know, legend at your high school and you just kept going and going. You found, you became a Christian in college and, and then you got into the church world. Yeah. And things were okay. You got married, things were good. And, but then something started to happen. Talk about church hurt. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, as you are growing up without this secure family, the church becomes that for you. At least I thought it was, and I, I didn't expect to be disappointed. Um, you know, I didn't expect to uh, have my have my world turned upside down. Um, but as I started to navigate the church space, um, I, would, I would get a lot of pushback. You know, initially it would be for stuff I'd, musically like you can't collaborate with certain artists but then as i started speaking out against injustices race and police brutality um a lot of the the churches turned their backs on me and um and i didn't understand a lot of people within these churches turned their backs on me and um and at the time i didn't get it at the time you know i didn't realize that i was you know it wasn't god it was god's people but it's still hurt like it was God. So I struggled heavily um, and uh, just found myself in a dark place, uh, feeling as if, you know, if this is how God's people are, this must be how God is. And why, why would I want to be with a God like this? It just disoriented me very badly. So his people distorted who God was in a way. Yeah. You say a couple of things from the book. Let me just read, read this one part. Um, very, very quick. Our understanding of God is shaped by whose version of Christianity is most appealing to us. And, and I fully agree because the North American church, you say the American church, I'm going to throw Canada in this too. So the North American church was late uh, to the party for condemning racism. Mm -hmm. What's it like for you to see the church ignore racial issues? Uh, it's, it's well, initially it was very unfortunate, very disheartening. Now, I think it's just evidence of where we are uh, in North America. Um, we have kind of created our own version of what we think Christianity is supposed to be. And so um, that excludes certain things and includes certain things. Um, and a, an example of that would just be where you exalt your nation above humanity. Um, you know, we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, um, but, but when you love your neighbor as yourself, your nation can't come before the actual neighbors in the nation. Um, and so in many ways, um, I get it. I totally get how we have made ourselves, you know, we, read the Bible and think of ourselves as David instead of seeing ourselves as, you know, uh, the prostitute who needs to come back home. Um, and so until we see ourselves as the, um, you know, the, the misfortunate or see people who are marginalized and disenfranchised, the least of these, 
um, there'll always be issues like class systems or racism or any of those things. You know, these are all they're all the same symptom. I mean, they're, they're just symptoms of the same disease. And that disease is um, an arrogance that puts someone above another person. With all this and, and there's there's more that's going on, but these things are going are, are just stewing in the background. And are you aware of this? Are you are you knowing how you're being triggered silently in a way? Now I do. I didn't before, you know, uh, historically. Um, you know, I, I, I kept I kept at it until it was literally destroying me um, now. Um, you know, I'm very, very aware and I won't in, engage in unhealthy ways. Um, sometimes you you say what needs to be said and then you move forward, um, but you can't sit and stew and argue. And that's a waste of my time and energy in this time how are you coping with it all? So this is, and we're, and we're not just talking about what's just happened in 2020. I think it was 2014 is when you said in your book that you started to really start to talk and speak out, uh, speak out against the church in racial matters. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So 2014, you start voicing your opinion on equality and how the church basically is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, the, the problem with, you know, even in the civil rights movement, there's a civil rights movement, the church led that. The problem with now, with what we're seeing now is that the church isn't leading it. And so there's other organizations or people groups leading it that the church may not necessarily agree with, but it doesn't mean that these issues don't still need to be dealt with. And so what the church in many ways, in many respects has done is it said, well, we don't like the way this is being handled, so we're gonna sit this one out instead of saying, well, we're gonna find a way to either A, um, work with these people and organizations or B, spearhead something that addresses the same issue that may be separate, but but something has to be done. And, um, and I think there's just a, a huge misunderstanding, humongous lack of education and understanding. Um, people don't know what we're looking at and they they just they, they believe the um whatever news outlets tell them is going on instead of having proximity and having relationships with people and understanding um the the realities of what we're facing so with all this going on you go into this clinical depression yeah how how do you start coping with this how do you start dealing with this yeah, it's a drift. You don't you don't fall into chaos. You drift into it. You know, it's not, it's like, you know what? I'm stressed. I'm drained. Forget it. Let's let's you know have a drink, and then tomorrow we'll have two, and then the next day we'll have three, and then four, and then I I just you know I'm starting to um, find unhealthy ways to cope, and you know what? I'm making bad decisions, and now let's you know get a prescription and and you know it's just a world of stuff that you slowly inch your way into before it gets out of control it doesn't you don't just dive in and all of a sudden you're drinking a bottle of liquor and popping pills it's you're meditating and ruminating on these issues and you're frustrated and you're trying to process and i remember laying on my bed a couple laying on the floor actually and just saying god i don't know if you're real and you got to convince me you are real because this is chaos right now. And it just got to a very dark place. I didn't want to do Bible study with my kids. I was like, I just don't know if this thing is real um, because of the voices that I've grown accustomed to listening to don't see this, these issues that I'm bringing up. And so I don't want to assume I know what they, I know something they don't know, but they don't seem to think this is an issue. And so, uh, I just found myself in a in a stupor. And I remember, you know, reading a lot of books from um, atheists and non-believers who were dealing with uh, the issue of race far better than believers were. And, I, and it really messed me up because now I'm like, why are people outside the church dealing with this better? And, uh, you know, just it, it spiraled me out of out of a healthy perspective. 
Yeah. It, and it, it, it took you to a place where you, you say you wanted to hand in the towel. Yeah. Like, yeah. Was that for real? Like you really wanted to give up on, like walk away from it all? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And without a doubt, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, I was, I was done, you know, and, and you, mind you, I've been, I know all of the biggest leaders in this space. Um, people were thinking I was on the verge of being one of the next Christian leaders. And so I'm walking in these spaces. I'm at the White House. I'm, I'm seeing all this stuff, but I'm not seeing solutions. And so I'm thinking to myself, this is all fake. This is all a charade. None of this is real. And, um, you know, it, it, it took a process of deconstruction before I could be reconstructed. And, and so part, part of that, from what, what I'm reading, is you're, you're done with the label. You're done with Christian hip hop, period. You're, you're done with Lecrae. You want to move away. And at this moment, you're so vulnerable. You even say you're done with your marriage. Yeah. But in a last ditch effort, what do you do? Uh, last ditch effort, you know, we, we go to Egypt. Um, I'm saying, hey, let me just start fresh. Let me just spend some time with my wife and let's see if we can try to build something and figure some stuff out. But, you know, the funny thing is, is when you're trying to fix a marriage without working on yourself, it's a futile attempt because you're trying to fix something without fixing the you're the part of the problem. You know what I mean? And so if you don't deal with you, you can't deal with us. And so I just didn't, I didn't have those tools. I didn't understand that. And I had to, um, you know, it was a great process where God started to help me understand that Lecrae, you don't have this whole thing figured out. And he was very gracious to me and, um, and, and walked me through some stuff, you know, and, and I wish I would have, been more attentive than I was at the time, but it was a process for me to get where I'm at. What, one of the stories that I love that you share in the book um, is when you're on tour with Jill Scott and you uh, you think about maybe like, yeah, I could, I could you know become a part of the Eastern Orthodox religion. I, I, could, I could do that. And, and then you go hop on stage and then <laughs> who shows up in the, in the dressing room backstage? An Eastern Orthodox priest, it was so wild. I was really wild. I was like, and God was trying to let me know, listen, I'm here and I'm bigger than you understand. I just, I, you know, part of it, sometimes you don't want to listen, right? Because that means you got to put the bottle down. That means you got to let go of the pills. That means you got to follow. And it's harder. It's easier to just say, I don't believe anything so I can do what I want to do, you know? And, uh, and unfortunately, that's the pathway to destruction. And so um, I, I had to learn that the hard way. Yeah. And you, you talk about after that, after coming back from Egypt, you know, the last resort for you was just to just be transparent, just mm -hmm. to completely like humiliate yourself and yeah. be humble in front of the closest people in your lives. Because up to that moment, who in your life knew really all that was going on? Nobody. Yeah. Really? No, I mean, I have friends who had inklings and ideas, but you know, sometimes, you know, you feel like you're, you're whining about your struggles. I mean, I, I'm more well off than they are. I've got awards, I've got all this stuff going for me. And then I'm coming to them complaining about, woe is me, my life is so bad. And, and I just was like, ah, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that. I don't, you know, and a lot of my friends were hurting, you know, um, in different ways, but there was just a lack of full transparency um, that, you know, I hadn't yet offered. And and part of it was because I was, I was just bitter, you know, I was bitter and I didn't want to go there. Um, but, but once you get to the end of yourself, you know, you realize how beneficial it is to just open up to the closest people and let them walk with you as you heal. What was it like for you just to finally share that with your friends, with your wife? Yeah, you know, it, it's a step toward healing because that's now you're saying that's like uh, walking into the hospital, right? If you if you have a disease or you're sick or you break your arm, 
walking into the hospital does not make you better. Walking into the hospital is the first step toward getting better. And so I think a lot of times we think, oh, shoot, um, I don't want to walk in there. But then once you do, you realize man, these people care about you. They're there to help you. They're there to, to walk with you. Um, and yeah, if you tell your doctor, you know, oh, man, I, you know, I got this pain in my stomach and the doctor's like, OK, well, what's going on? Well, of course, it's going to be embarrassing to say that I ate six gallons of ice cream. Right. You know, that's embarrassing. But even after you go through that, the doctor's then going to say, all right, let's help you work through this. And that's what my family, my friends, my wife all did was there's the initial like, what? You know, I mean, everyone's going to respond differently. Some people will say, I can't believe this. Why didn't you tell me? Other people will say, you know, um, man, this is crazy. I don't know what to do. But um, in the in the end, they all if they really love you and care about you, they'll figure it out with you, you know, because you all, you will all figure it out together. And, and from that moment, did they disown you or did they walk with you? They walked with me. Yeah, absolutely. They walked with me, still walk with me to this day, years later. Amazing. What, what, what is that moment? Was there fear there prior to this? Like, is there a reason why you didn't go to them earlier? Yeah, we're all afraid of being rejected. You know, at the end of the day, we're afraid of being rejected by those we love. Um, if you're not afraid of being rejected, then you're just prideful to admit that you don't have it all together. You know, but both of them are forms of pride. One is an inverted pride that says, I, you know, it's so focused. Both are focused on self. One is exalted self. I'm, I, I can't let anyone see that I'm not as perfect as I think I am. The other is a focus on self that's so consumed with you that if someone rejects you, you don't know how you'll go on living anymore. And, I, you know, I was the second. It was like, oh, no, I've been rejected by my family, rejected by my father. I don't I can't take being rejected by my friends or my wife. And, you know, God had to let me know, like, no matter what happens, I got you and I'll never reject you. I'll never forsake you. And uh, that was game changer for me. And the, the great thing about, about how you describe this is your process, like everyone else's process is not overnight. I think you described it as 18 month process. Yeah. Yeah. And still from then to now, it's there's been change probably from then to now too. Absolutely. Yeah. Different issues now. You know, you, but you walk through them. You know, yeah. <laughs> there's always more. Yeah. There's always more. restoration is not a destination, it's a journey, baby. Yeah. Did you ever feel like giving up though? Even though once you had sort of like confessed, you've thrown it, you've told everyone what's up. Now the work is now ahead of you. The doctor has been in, you know, he's telling you this is what you need to do now to get healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's generally, there's always going to be some consequences from your actions or, you know, there, there, there's, there's just lasting things that are always the case. Um, when someone passes away, years can go by. There's still the, it still affects you, right? You, you may still cry at the thought of them. There's just, there's lasting effects of decisions and of experiences. And so, um, you know, you want to quit because you're still feeling those effects. But as time goes on, the effects don't go away. You just know how to deal with them better. You know how to manage them better. You still get a little choked up when you know when you think about dad being gone, but you you're not distraught and depressed and you want to lay in your bed all day. You just you're like, man, that that stings and we and we move forward. And so early on, you do want to quit because you're like, this is too much, you know, having to face myself and face this reality. And how do I do this? It's a lot. But you know, we keep moving forward. And I, and I don't want to say I did this alone. I had therapists <laughs> and pastors around me as well. So that all of that was very necessary. It was so heartwarming for me when you were talking about the friends circling around you, like basically they, they were there for you. And it makes me think of like David in the Bible. He, he was known to be a, a conqueror, a warrior, but he also ruled with his mighty men. And who, who would David be without his mighty men? <laughs> exactly. 
he needed him. He needed his Jonathan, he needed his Nathans, he needed his mighty men to get to, to go through that journey. To to hear someone like you admit these things, mm -hmm. it gives hope for so many people. It gives it hope for me. It gives hope for, because you you went through the process. The fire was hot, but you made it through. Absolutely. Where do you think you'd be if you didn't confess? If you didn't, if you didn't take that trip to Egypt, or if you just ignored God, basically, because He would have tried it another way. You know that. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly think, you know, it'd be dark. Um, I mean, I, honestly, I think God is the one that that stopped me in my tracks. I don't, I don't think there was an end in sight. I think, you know similar to us I, I think i saw my fate like samson you know like i'm just gonna keep going down this pathway until uh my I, i'm blinded you know what i mean and uh and so you know i don't I, i'm i'm grateful that i was stopped in my tracks where i was because who knows you know who knows you talked about your dad and uh you got to reconnect with your dad after many years of not seeing him uh, when was the last time you saw him before you reconnected with him? I was probably five. I saw him once. The one time he came to visit me. So I was probably about five years old. So I hadn't seen him in all that time. Wow. I'm yeah, not cool. trying to get your age out of you right now, but that a, a long period of time. Decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe two decades. But... What was that like to reconnect? Because you, you put that video out for people to see. What was that like after the cameras turned off and you went home? It was great. I mean, you know, I, I, that, I couldn't have asked for more. Um, I had managed my expectations and I got more than what I had imagined. And, um, you know, I had questions answered that I had always had. Have you guys, has your relationship continued to this day? Yeah, I mean, um, he lives miles away, but uh, a, he's always a text away, a phone conversation away. And, um, you know, um, if I get, when the world opens back up and I can get back out to the West Coast, uh, then, you know, we can we can have more conversations and, and sit down and continue talking. You You talk about in your book, that you can't always change the situation. Uh, you can't always change the situation, but you can be changed in your situation. That is a great way to look at no matter what's going on, where we're at, we can't always control everything, but we can allow ourselves to be changed by God, by people that are surrounding us, by reading the Bible, by, by great mentors. I think this is just an incredible, uh, incredible tool for so many people that are going through hurt, going through pain, but people just to get a good perspective of how life has been like for someone that they've followed for so long. Mm -hmm. So thank That's you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for writing this. What's, what's the one hope from this that you have that everyone takes away? What's the one hope from this book that everyone takes away? Um, that you're never too far gone, that this is not the end, whatever it is you're dealing with or battling or wrestling with. Um, it's, it's never, you're never too far to find restoration. You know, um, it's going to look different for everybody, but, uh, it's, it's, it's not out of reach, you know, regardless of what it is. I don't care whatever the situation is. Um, you're not too far. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. If you have any comments or questions, leave them below. Subscribe on all the platforms you're listening. Like, share, and ring that bell for us. The This Is Me TV podcast is brought to you by Impactus. For more resources, This Is Me TV episodes, and how to give, head to impactus.org.